This is The Brandon Smith Show, and I'm your host, Brandon Smith. And the entire purpose of the show is one singular thing, and that is to help you live a life that much more free from dysfunction. So today, our topic today, we are going to talk about embracing change at work. Carrie, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Brandon? I am super excited about this topic. So uh, for everyone listening and watching, I have an awesome guest on our show today, Carrie McGee. And Carrie, I want to make sure I get your title right. You're the VP and Managing Director for HRQ Incorporated. That's correct. That's yeah. the title. Yeah. Uh, and so I want I want you to jam a little bit on, uh, we're jumping to our topic, which I'm super excited about. But before yeah. we do that, tell us a little bit about um, you, like what, what you're up to. Yeah. And, you know, I love story time. So I'd yeah. love to hear a little bit about like how you how you even got into this. Yeah. So I um, have been in the field of human capital for a very, very long time, but um, really was doing that inside corporations for uh, a very long time, about 15 years. Um, my passion is really around people and them being the incremental difference difference in whether or not an organization is successful. Um, I did, for about seven years, move out of the human resources, human capital space to lead business functions, to really broaden my ability to impact people. See, I think I remember you telling me that, yeah. but for some reason I forgot about that. That's a really important part of your story. It is, yeah. Yeah, so really um, sitting in the human resources chair is very helpful to the organization and very important function, but if you don't really sit in a business role, your ability to truly understand what's moving the dial and not moving the dial in the organization and with the people is limited. So I made a very strategic move. Um, I was working for a large banking organization during the financial crisis and my organ my job got eliminated. Wow. And instead of going and finding another human resources job, I made the decision to stay with the bank and go into a business role. I, I had great relationships with my business leaders and I was allowed to go into a customer relationship management role and really support our largest customer, which is a big retailer. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say their name, but they're here in the Atlanta area. So one of the largest retailers in the United States and yeah. supported them. So really learned what does that look like from an employee experience perspective? What does that look like in terms of how the company makes money? And um, enjoyed it so much, decided to stay in the business and was asked to become the chief operating officer's chief of staff. So moved into that role and in that role built and led a client experience function. So really wow. um, a varied background, an unusual background. Totally. Um, yeah. And honestly thought I would stay in the business because uh, Going back to my passion about people, really my ability to have impact on people was larger in the business role. Really, I was leading large teams. I was driving impact for them, which was then driving impact for the business. Um, and, then, and as their day-to-day -day manager, you yeah. can provide them a lot more daily guidance and right. coaching and counsel. And I just got the opportunity to develop them personally and see them thrive. And so I loved, How cool. loved that. I can see just looking in your eyes yeah. that that was a super exciting part of your job. Oh my gosh, it was amazing. And so I was actually going to move more down down a general manager path with the bank, um, but had an opportunity to create a market for HRQ here in Atlanta. Wow. And that um, was a moment in my life where it felt like if I said no, I would regret it forever because I got to build a business. So you had to embrace change. I had to embrace change. <laughs> your, your story fits really well with our topic yeah, today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just really, um, for me, about how do you make the most impact in the work that you do? And it always comes down to the people um, and creating a culture and environment for people to be rock stars. In, and be themselves 100%. So in terms of what you all do at HRQ, tell yeah. us a little bit about, for those that aren't familiar, what is it that you, you all do in kind of a day-to-day, yeah. week-to-week basis? Yeah, so what we do is we provide talent um, in the human resources, human capital space that allows HR departments to provide that really business impactful role. So we do executive search only for HR leaders. We do project management, so we'll be an extra pair of hands to come in and do what an small HR organization might not be able to afford to do, but needs to get done. And then mm -hmm. we do human capital consulting in the more strategic places like 
predictive workforce analytics, talent succession planning, really helping senior leaders, mm -hmm. the, really the C-suite, figure out how do they really have a strong talent strategy that's going to differentiate them in the marketplace. So it sounds like a pretty full suite kind of offering. Yeah. We can help provide them talent. We can help provide you an extra set of hands, and we can help provide you extra thinking. Yeah. So kind of all those things. That's right. And our, our firm is unique in that we're built on former HR and business leaders. So you often find in our space you'll have recruiting firms who have Yep. done recruiting and they know recruiting very well. Most of them have not, I wouldn't say 100%, but most of them have not worked in organizations themselves or sat in chair. Um, and you'll find consultants who do consulting work, but it's very rare to find people who really um, can do the full suite and really support the HR organization, which is really a organization that doesn't get the love. They're doing this for their internal clients, but no one's really doing it for them and they really need it and more and more it's the differentiator for businesses that are going to thrive in this new economy and those that are not going to thrive so, yeah, i love your passion about this yeah I, I share the same passion yeah so let's talk about our topic okay All right, so we we're going to go down the path of embracing change um, and I know you've got some thoughts around this. Yeah. So where would you like to dive in around this? Well, I have, what I would say is that uh, you often hear the term, the future of work. I would say the future is now, and there are um, several trends out there uh, happening in this space. Um, and I think that as an employer or an employee, you've got to embrace these trends. I wanna talk about the three that I think are the most impactful for organizations um, and probably the most scary for organizations to really well, grab I'm, onto. I'm getting nervous already. <laughs> I'm nervous already. So yeah. we got three, yeah, three big scary monsters coming yeah. around the corner that we need to learn how to give rather than run away, right. turn and give them big hugs. That's right. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm getting, I'm getting my arms ready for hugs. Okay. Okay. What's the first one? So the first one is probably the one most people have heard a lot about, um, which is the freelance or gig economy. Sometimes you hear it referred to as the Uber economy, mm -hmm. which is really talent on demand. Um, and more and more we see the workforce voluntarily shifting to that kind of work. Um, and what it means is that you're no longer in that long-term employer-employee relationship. Um, and so as an employee, that can be scary, right? Because the um, comfort of this is my employer, they're going to take care of me is gone. Why I think you can you should embrace it as an employee is because it gives you so much opportunity to pick the work that is going to make you shine and is going to make you excel to the next level. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop you here because I want you to continue down this path. I beat this drum all the time. I had a conversation with somebody this week who had just lost their job. And I said, you are so, this person is a creative. I said, you're so set up for awesome stuff. Yeah. You should embrace this. But there's this fear they have. So you know how sometimes you can tell somebody something right. and they won't listen to you, but they'll listen to somebody else? Right. You're that somebody else. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So for the, all those people who are listening right now, that this is so scary, this idea of leaving a, mm -hmm. a, safe and secure right. full-time employment job, right. which I, I would argue is also a myth. Right. Um, what would you tell them and why this is a good idea? Well, it's a, a little bit of what you just said is certainly one of the points, which is if you look at organizations of all sizes, but particularly the large ones where people tend to fall into that comfort zone, they are not safe harbors anymore. More and more the competition is there. You see activist investors coming in and destroying those organizations. Um, large organizations all over this country are laying off and you don't have any control over that. It's It happens to you when it happens to you versus if if you're a freelancer, you have complete control over going after the work, doing the work you want to do, um, and not being reliant on someone else to make decisions about your life. So that is scary, but I don't think that you're safe. No, I'd really much rather have someone else make decisions about my life. <laughs> yeah. I just right. that sounds way more appealing right. to me. Yeah. So, but I someone think it's um, so that's that's one. I would say also it's just that um, employers are more and more just going to this model, right? So 
I'm going to get the dates kind of wrong, but I think it's by 2020, 50% of work will be sitting in this space. So it, it will be the type of work that's out there and available. You can see it already. There are um, companies who do things where they source talent for project work and then they activate it on demand for their clients. So it's out there and the work is available. It's plentiful. So it shouldn't be scary because more and more of these models are being built and the and people are working. It's it's not that people are sitting at home hoping for work. That's my entire life is this. Yeah. It's a big portfolio. It's a big spreadsheet right. of all different kinds of services and clients that I work with. Right. And it gives me so much job security and I have so much freedom. Well, exactly. And I think that's sort of the third point. I also, I, as I mentioned early in the podcast, I left big, comfortable, large organization, 20 years in different organizations like that to come do what I'm doing. Now I work for someone, but really what I do every day is earn my living. And I love it because I get to decide what am I going to do to make an impact with with my clients and with the people in my orb that I want to make an impact with. Yeah. And that's so much more fulfilling. Oh, I can totally see it in your eyes. Yeah. You know, and a side note, so uh, my webmaster, Kristen, who does amazing work, she has this kind of life. Yeah. And every year I, I admire it and I'm almost a little, bit, a little bit jealous. Every year for about six weeks, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more, she goes to somewhere in Europe and does all her work from like an Airbnb. Yeah. So this year she said, yeah, I've never been to Malta. I'm going to Malta. Right. But you can do that. You can do that. With that kind of life. You can do that. It's, it. you know, I feel like I have this conversation a lot with some of our um, folks who go through a layoff that I um, work with as they're looking for a new role. Um, and I say to them, if they have any inkling of, hey, I just, I'm done with the corporate gig. I feel really burnt out by it. I don't know that I want to go back to it. I always say, take the leap. You'll never You'll never regret it. I, I agree completely. Yeah. I agree completely. Now, yeah. the, one, one more important point that you mentioned, too, that you know, you and I have been geeky. We've kind of talked about some of the business yeah. stuff before over, over lunch. Yeah. Um, I, there's not one client I work with right now, large, big company, that isn't dealing with the under siege by activist investors. Right. Coming in and saying, no, 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 you're not, you're not near as efficient enough, and here's how you're going to do it. And it always involves slashing headcount. Yeah. And pulling people out from the field and centralizing functions, yeah. whether it should happen or not, their goal is not necessarily A, an employee's well-being or B, the long-term health and maybe more of a short term. Right. But that's definitely driving a lot of change. Yeah. And I, I think I mentioned to you, I read a book and I don't know if I can plug the book, but there is a... Oh, plug away. Okay. There's a book called The Vanishing American Corporation by Jerry Davis. And it talks about this. It actually gives you a full history of the evolution of American companies um, and then talks about why these large companies will not be... They'll be there, some of them, but um, not in the size and scope that they are go forward, and they will just be shaped completely differently. So this is just wow. the beginning. It's not, you know, we will not have the same business landscape 10 years from now that we have today in terms of how work gets done. Wow, just the beginning. Yeah, Okay, sure. so we need to go give this big, scary, furry, purple monster called the gig economy a big hug. Yes, absolutely. Go give him a big. This, this this one will be a he. We're gonna go give him a big give hug. Give him a hug, and tell him it's oh, it's gonna be everything's gonna work out okay. We're gonna be friends. Tell him not only that I'm gonna be my better, authentic, bring myself to work a hundred percent every day. That sounds like we're giving him a high five. Too. High five. High yeah. five and a hug. And a hug. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Yeah. So all right. So we got gig economy kind of as one. Yeah. What's the next one? The next change that you say? Yeah, we need to learn how to embrace this. Yeah. So I would say artificial intelligence, machine learning robotics that can be so scary for people because they think but wait that's the job I do you're asking a machine to do my work and if you really think about it the work that you do that can be done by a robot is not fulfilling work for you it is not work that feeds your soul it's work that has to be done um, and often is something that becomes a stepping stone for people in their careers. But if you could just do the work that impacts humans, that machines and robots can't do, 
you will be so much more fulfilled in the work that you do. And that will never go away. Human on human contact in getting anything done in this world is necessary and will not change. And so we should really embrace that we don't have to do the menial tasks anymore, that we don't have to do the crunching of numbers that a machine can do for us. We can just look at those numbers that have been crunched and say, here's kind of what I take from that and this is what I would recommend based on what I'm seeing. So you're saying I don't have to worry about one day there's going to be a big robotic Brandon sitting in this chair doing my podcast. Exactly. Let's hope I, not. I was, I, yeah, let's hope not. I was worried about that. I yeah. was worried. I had already said Whitney was going to go ahead and get a robot. Yeah. <laughs> start doing my job for me. Yeah. So good, because I'm doing people stuff. Yeah. And people stuff is... People stuff, I'm I'm safe. Right. You're safe. And you're probably more fulfilled. I mean, I think that's a myth that we hear is that we're getting less and less in tune with ourselves as we get more and more entrenched in um, information age and our, you know, devices. And while we do have more efficiency and we probably have some habits we need to examine. We also, as humans, still want, we get efficiency out of those that gives us more time with each other, and we should embrace that. Yeah, so uh, you know, that's a really nice way to spin it, that this is going to give us, rather than be scared of this, this is going to be a big, scaly, shiny monster. Yeah. And rather than being scared of this big, scaly, shiny monster, we, again, we should embrace this monster, too, because it's going to give us more time. Right. And more time to connect. Right. With, either with people that matter to us in our professional life, but also people that matter to us in our personal 100%. life. hundred percent. A hundred percent. I like this monster. Yeah, I like him too. I'm, I'm going to give this one a high five too. Okay. I don't too. know. I don't know about giving a hug to a big scaly shiny. Yeah. But a high five for sure. I think a high five for sure. Yeah. And a thumbs up. Wait, a thumbs up. Yeah. yeah I totally. Can, we'll go with the thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we've given we've given a couple big monsters some high fives and yeah. some hugs. What's our third one? So um, the oh, third. I ahead. just realized I am at break. And I oh. think I've way run over break, and Isaac's let me do it. I got excited about our monsters. Oh, okay. So let's take a break. Let's do it. And now's perfect timing because I won't spoil our third final monster okay. who's going to show up. Perfect. So we'll take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about this last monster that we need to embrace change. Yeah. Other ways we can do this. And before you know it, we'll be ready to take on this the future which is now. The future which is now. Future yeah. which is now. Oh, so stay yeah. tuned. Hey everyone, this is Brandon. I want to take a moment to thank you for listening to my show. We wouldn't have a show without you. In an effort to get you the topics, guests, and resources that'll make your life better, I need your help. Go to theworkplacetherapist.com, www.theworkplacetherapist, all one word, .com, and take the listener survey that's all about you and your needs. We'll be giving away a $50 Amazon gift card to one lucky listener. I look forward to hearing from you. Let's eliminate dysfunction together. Welcome back to the Brandon Smith Show. And of course, I'm your host, Brandon Smith. And today we're talking about embracing change. And I've got Carrie McGee here with us. Carrie. Hi. I, I am super excited. We've already talked about two big, scary monsters. Yeah. We gave our first monster, the freelance economy and gig economy, we gave that monster a big hug and a high five. Yep. Our second monster is the AI, artificial intelligence and all the things that kind of come around that. Yeah. And we've given that one kind of a that big, scaly, shiny monster, more of a high five and a thumbs up. Yeah. Uh, and during the break, we were talking a little bit more about people being being really freaked out by that and scared. Yeah. You know, Isaac said, yeah, people are really scared by that. Yeah. When you think about, and, and w I loved your counsel. Your counsel was, you know, think about the stuff that you do in your job that's more people focused and really kind of double down in that. And avoid, and the stuff that's more automatable, that's a word. Yeah. That's the stuff that's going to go away, but that's okay. Yeah. Be more on the people side of that. Now, given all that, do you think there are more um, there are jobs that um, are more at risk than others that you would that you would say in, in those might be professions that are going to have more of their day to day activities taken away versus other professions? You know, it's a good question. Um, 
And I don't know. I mean, I, I, I got to be honest. I don't know. I think in professional jobs, not so much. I mean, I'll give you an example in the human resources space. So in the human resources space, talent acquisition is a place where a lot of this machine learning artificial intelligence stuff is starting to take hold. Things like actively going out and finding candidates, um, scouring you know, social media profiles, and then putting a candidate slate together um, that meets specific needs that a client's asking for. So, so just to back up on that, basically we can teach a machine an algorithm yes. and say, look for these kinds of qualities. Right. And then it can actually start to learn and say, ah, I noticed, yeah. I, I noticed, uh, that people with these qualities also had this quality, and they can get smarter and smarter looking for that right. kind of perfect algorithm. Right, and they can go out um, more efficiently to all of the possible places that person is on the internet and piece together their story and how that fits with a profile. Um, today, we have people called sourcers, researchers who do that work that will no longer be their work. There will be a machine doing that job. Mm. But they'll be free then to not have to enter that space there. I'm sure they're getting into this line of work not to do the sourcing and researching, but because they enjoy finding good talent for people. And they'll be able to spend their time with the people and really get into, hey, you seem like a great fit for this, but let's really talk about the role and the culture and how you're a fit for that. Those are the intangibles that can a machine can't can't learn. Um, and so I think that's an example of a job, a professional job that's changing. Um, and will a sourcer still be around? Probably not in the form or a researcher in the form that it is today, but they'll have probably a richer job to do. Yeah, so I'm hearing you say too in this is really th- think about the people skill side of all this yeah. and how you can really invest and get better at that. Yeah. I know one of the other professions that's concerned about this, there's a lot, I'm sure. Yeah. Accountants. Yeah. Because accountants, it's really basically just follow a set of rules. Right. And whenever you're following a set of rules um, that's pretty black and white, yeah. you can teach that to a machine fairly easily. Yeah. But they might not be able to advise well, that's or to right. give that kind of counsel. Right. So how do you kind of move from doing the work to advising? Yeah, and the other thing I would add to this is that the skill, again, it's the people side of it, but it's also the analytic side of it that you're gonna, everyone needs to amp up their skill set there. So you can't just look for the information. You now will be given the information and it's your job to analyze it and mm. make sense of it for the people that you're assisting. And so um, I myself am actually going to take a micro course on data analytics because I feel like that's a skill set everybody needs. And you can do that and it's free. Um, but this is something that we all, I think that's a skill that everyone, uh, along with beefing up, how do I interact with people? How do I make sense of all this information these machines are producing for me? in a way that I can articulate and storytell to people. That's great, so you gave, you right there, you gave a lot of hope to those introverts that are like, I really don't wanna deal with people. Yeah. Because you said, hey, but there's also gonna be room for you in the analytic space. Yes. So you, you, there's gonna, it's gonna be different, but there's still places for everyone to play. I think that's true, yeah. I mean, I, th- I yes, I think that's true. Because I think the human element of anything cannot be fully replaced. And if you take our two monsters that we've covered today and you put them together, then you can do a little bit of one thing over here and right. a little bit of another thing over there. You know, you want to uh, you pick up yoga and start teaching yoga classes, you can do that too. Kristen Lee, who is my web guru I mentioned earlier, yeah. she teaches yoga classes as well. Yeah. So you, you can kind of create, create and craft a life that involves different pieces. And that goes back to kind of what I said earlier on, which is you get to bring your whole self to your to your work and to your life. So I feel like in the past you've had to compartmentalize all of that and now you're just kind of waking up and um, the more you embrace these changes, you just feel authentically you all day long, which okay. is I think amazing. Okay, so now I'm picturing our two monsters actually with their arms around each other giving each other big hugs. Yeah. So good. that's good. So there's you said there's a third monster. The third monster is really um, group achievement versus individual achievement. So mm. if you think about traditionally how organizations have been structured, they've been hierarchical, command and control in nature. Everyone has a box. They fit in that box and you are rewarded for your individual 
achievement. And you, in some cases, in large organizations, probably all organizations, um, that creates a really toxic culture. I'm sure you've seen that in your coaching work, where people want the individual glory, and um, they're not bad people outside of work, but they um, exhibit some not so healthy behaviors inside of work because of the reward and recognition system. And that's changing. Um, where, you know, really the tech industry started it. They started uh, the idea of agile. I don't know if you're familiar with I am. that. Yeah. Just enough to be dangerous. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, <laughs> so, you know, agile is the concept that you are always iterating. You're working in cross-functional teams to solve a problem. And failure is not only accepted, it's applauded because you're always quickly going to market with ideas, testing them, revisiting it um, and just getting a good product you may not get there faster but you're going to have a better product at the end and so it started um, really in the tech industry it's moved to most IT departments that I know of a lot of them are doing it they're called scrum teams um, and recently in the most recent um, Harvard Business Review article uh, there was a full the front page or the front cover said um, Agile to scale. And really the crux of the article is it is going to be in every part of every organization and we are no longer going to operate in that hierarchical mode or those that are going to compete, those that are going to come out ahead are going to figure out how to be agile across the organization, work in teams and not work in that command and control environment. Your three monsters all play together. They They're do. They're all on the same playground. Yes, they are. Because this one's not like hanging out over by the side, stealing yeah. the other two's ball. Yeah. Because if we play them all out, play this out, we say, okay, it's going to be less full-time employees and more collection of people that are brought together yeah. to do work. And they're going to have to do it in these kind of flexible, agile teams Yeah. And that come together for a project and then maybe disband and they get on a new project. And they're going to have to work with uh, information and with machine learning right. um, to make sense of it and yeah. to kind of drive it forward. Uh, and they're going to have to learn how to play together because that's how they're going to get the next engagement. That's right. And and we see some companies, those are out in front of this, where um, it's not a manager who's rating uh, a particular employee. Oh, I know where you're it's going the with this. team I is knew rating where each you were other. Going with this. And they pick their leader. Mm. So they monitor the leadership behaviors of the people they're working on the team with and they essentially elect the leader based on their leadership qualities um, and it's amazing and it really going back to your point of not everybody wants to be sitting in that leadership chair someone just wants some people just want to be doers and that's okay um, but yeah it's not about again it's not about some manager who was very proficient in the role getting promoted up and telling others now what needs to be done in a particular, you know, functional area, but more a cross-functional skill set coming together for a short period of time. And those that are most valuable um, being really acknowledged by their peers and no one but their peers, which honestly, I mean, how could you not love that? How could, how could you not? Who, how many employees do you know who say performance ratings aren't fair, my boss doesn't know what I do every day. They don't see what I do every day. That goes away in this model. The I love it. Yeah. You know what I love about it too is it just puts, it keeps in, this is often an issue I have with my with the clients I work with, and it's a very simple change. If you just view everyone around you as a customer, right? it changes completely how you interact. That's right. No longer do you say, well, it's my boss's job to support me or give me resources. She should be doing more of this. All of a sudden you say, oh, my boss is my number one customer. What can I be doing to help her, make her life better, and, and coordinate what I'm doing with her? That's right. And so this model does that. It gets you in the mindset of everyone on my team is a customer. Right. And we need to all figure out a way to work better together. Right. So it, it, And it unlocks that for people. Yeah. And it, So it should, in theory, get everyone playing a lot nicer together. Yeah. A lot less dysfunction, a yeah. lot less politics. Yeah. And a little more care and sensitivity. Right. And if you can't do that or don't do that, then you won't necessarily be asked to come on the next project. Right. And so there's there's immediate kind of reward and incentive to yeah. operate, to play nice. Yeah, you actually, that's exactly right. So your rating from your team determines... You know, it's sort of like your Uber rating or your Airbnb rating. You know, you get so many stars 
and then they determine whether or not they're gonna let you rent for them, pick you up, all of that. I just, so just need to come into work with a little yeah. little, little container of mints you know, <laughs> and say, oh, yeah. please take a mint and, and a bottle of water. It's no longer donuts, I guess. <laughs> donuts are out, but That's right. <laughs> yeah, mints and water mints are and water. good. Yeah, maybe protein bars. I don't protein know. Protein bars. Yeah. That's- that's yeah, exactly right. yeah. So I think it's really exciting. And I, I, to your point, like, I just feel like it, there, there's just a lot that traditional and command and control is there for a reason. Going back to that book I mentioned, they talk about why that came into be in the industrial age. It just doesn't apply anymore as companies become more nimble and need to move quicker. They can't afford all of that hierarchy and they don't need the stability that that provided anymore. They just they need the flexibility. So. Yes, we're getting close on time. Is there any last kind of closing piece of advice you'd have on this before we move to our life hack? When you think about people that are, because I, I imagine I mean, this could be a whole other show, which we may need to do, but yeah. it could even vary based on age. You know, yeah. h- How do you set up a college graduate for this versus someone in their 30s versus someone who's in their 40s or 50s? Yeah. But is there a general piece of advice that you would say that people could take away as they're thinking about giving hugs to these three big monsters? Yeah, I mean, I would say um, in terms of advice, if you're scared about it, just ask yourself why and if it's rational. Um, Because I, you know, it's not if you really take some time to learn more about what this really means and look at it as an opportunity. Um, to figure out what's next for you. I mean, I just think it opens up so much to opportunity do. to grow and be bigger than you ever thought you could be. I wish everyone could see this, the excitement and sparkle in your eyes when you say it, because I, they would they would believe it that much more if they could see it. <laughs> and I think it's so it's very true. I think I absolutely I think it's so very true. Just yeah. I had a good mentor of mine to your point and he would say you know, he used to, he grew up in the therapy world and then shifted into executive coaching and when he would be working with a, a client trying to get her or him to change and they were really resistant to change yeah. he'd look them in the eye and he'd lean across the table and he'd say I promise you're not going to die <laughs> Exactly. Right? It's like not, you're not, yeah. not going to die. It's not going to happen. No. He's, yeah. You know, so you're, if you're worried about like that, that's not, you know, it's, you're yeah. going to be okay. Yeah. You, you'll, you'll get through it. Yeah. Just, just, just take that, embrace that change. Do and, it. Jump. Yeah. I jumped and I'm okay. You can jump too. I jumped. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay. I think I'm okay. I'm a bit a little crazy, but yeah. I'm okay. I'm happy with my crazy. Yeah. So um, I ask all my guests this uh, yeah. for a life hack. So now that we've come to the end of our show, what's one life hack, something we could be doing to make our lives that much more free from dysfunction, either personally or professionally? Yeah. So I thought a lot about this. And for me, what I do is... I dream. I dream big and I put together plans of mm. how I'm going to accomplish those dreams. I, You know what? They Sometimes they happen that way. Sometimes they don't. But what I do do is think about, okay, if that's my dream, what do I need to be doing now so that if my life tr- circumstances change to a point where that dream is now a possibility, I'm ready. And I think about it in terms of my health and wellness. I think about it in terms of my financial stability. I think about it in terms of the knowledge I have. So I talked to you about the micro degree that I'm yeah, gonna totally. audit. Um, and I think about it in terms of, uh, I'm missing one, let me, um, networks and relationships. Who do I need to know? And am I cool. doing that? So that's my, um, that's my life hack advice. If you do that, so I never worry. Like if my job goes away tomorrow, I'm not worried about that. I don't think it will, but I, yeah. I have like three or four things that are possible roads I can take. And I've been building towards those so that if that happens, I'm in a place of resiliency and optimism and frankly, excitement and joy. Yeah. So, and I, I yeah. So one more thing on this, I was listening to, um, an interview, Terry Gross on Fresh Air, actually, yeah. and it was someone whose spouse had gone through a, a significant health issue. And Terry asked him, her, well, did you start, you know, scenario planning for what you're going to do if he didn't make it? And she's like, no, I, did, I couldn't. That's not where I was. And that's the value, the value of this is you won't be able to do it when sudden change happens. But if you've thought about it beforehand, it just doesn't hit you as hard. Okay, so I want to ask a follow-up question. I normally don't do this, but I want to because yeah. some people um, don't know how to dream. Yeah. So when you say you dream and you kind of have this image in your mind of what's possible, of what yeah. you would like to see, 
more practically or tactically? Do you look three years out, one year out, five years out, ten years out? Yeah. Well, I'm trying to give people who struggle with dreaming yeah. like a way to anchor this. Um, so my current dreams are about two years out. Okay, so you'll, you'll yeah. typically kind of look at like a two-year horizon yeah. and anchor to that. Yeah, and they're anchored to that because I can see put, I what I can predict says in about two years there could be significant change in my life. My parents are getting older. Um, you know, I can see my career uh, morphing in the next two-year t- period of time. And yeah. so that, for me, is why it makes sense. But I think it's more like, as you look at your life circumstances, how likely is change? Now, you can't predict everything, but for me, it's two years. And I think that's comfortable because I feel like if it happened sooner, I'd be ready because I'm preparing now. Okay. Carrie, I've taken away a lot from today. i got good. some work to do. Yeah. I've got some serious work to do. Well, good. And I'm definitely going to be continue giving those big hairy monsters hugs. Yeah. Um, in terms of where folks can go to learn more about you. Yeah. Where, where are places they can go to learn more about you and what you're up to? Yeah. So um, certainly on our company website, which is www.hrqinc.com. I'm on LinkedIn as Carrie McGee, C-A-R-R-I-E-M-A-G-E-E. And I'm on Facebook and Twitter. So... You awesome. can see me in all those places. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for coming yeah. on today. This Thanks was for having phenomenal. Me. I know you helped a lot of folks along the way. Well, I hope so. It's so fun to, you know, I'm just so crazy passionate about this. So and that's obvious. Yeah. And that's exactly what we need. So yeah. uh, for those of you listening and watching, uh, continue to fight every week against workplace dysfunction. Doesn't have to be this hard. And of course, uh, keep following us every week. So we're on facebook.com forward slash Brandon Smith WPT for workplace therapist. Or check us out on Twitter at the WP Therapist. Um, the website, the Workplace Therapist, is there for you. It's got resources that you can pull up all to make your workplace and work life better. And of course, we drop a new show every Sunday at 9:30 p.m. So until next week in our next show, have a great week and an awesome life. <laughs>